I believe that every cheater should be punished so that in the future he never even thinks about cheating. I couldn't say anything bad about my wife. She was an angel to me, at least until I caught her cheating. And after that, I wanted to turn her life into a real hell. And whether I did it or not, you'll find out now. Things had been quite hectic at home and work lately. I had been putting in a lot of effort dealing with machinery breakdowns and finally persuaded my boss to implement a servicing plan instead of waiting for equipment to fail before fixing it. I spent a significant amount of time gathering all the necessary data to present to him, showing that his current approach was a false economy. I dedicated most of my evenings for several weeks to analyzing breakdown statistics and service plans. However, I made sure to take weekends off to spend time with my wife, Caroline, my attractive 42-year-old partner. Caroline was also busy with her job as an admin assistant at a local college, which had undergone major changes. They received an Requires Improvement Rating from Ofsted, prompting a thorough review and the initiation of an improvement program. As a result, she often worked late both at the office and at home in the evenings. Yet, like me, she made it a point to take weekends off so we could be together, especially when our son Jason came home from university with his girlfriend. I checked the weather forecast for the upcoming weekend, and it looked promising. We were nearing the end of a long, wet, windy, and cold winter. Both of us had been working hard, so I decided to surprise the love of my life. We have a static caravan on the south coast, just outside Christchurch in a holiday park. It was currently winterized. Dewinterizing it is a bit of a hassle, so I thought I'd take a day off work, my boss owed me one anyway, and get it ready for the weekend, surprising Caroline with a getaway for just the two of us. It wouldn't take me long to dewinterize it and air out the bedding on my own. After all, I had winterized it by myself the previous autumn. It's much easier to handle that sort of thing without any ladies around. I spoke with my boss and informed him that I would be taking Tuesday off, explaining the reason in case Caroline called. I planned to take my laptop with me so I could handle any urgent work from there, as the internet coverage was excellent. Since the site would be quite empty, the speeds would be good. The site remains open during the winter, and a few hardy souls use it year-round. In fact, a couple of years ago, the whole family, including Jason and his girlfriend, spent Christmas and New Year there, and it was wonderful. I told Caroline that I had an early meeting so I could leave early and avoid most of the traffic. I also mentioned that I might be home late due to traffic. I managed to reach the van with plenty of time to spare and went about my usual routine. I had left the caravan keys on the hook at home so Caroline wouldn't notice they were missing and start asking questions, which would spoil my surprise. I even bought a bunch of roses intending to leave them in the van to make it smell nice for when we came down for the weekend, as it can smell a bit stale after winter. Plus, I know she loves roses. There was a spare key hidden under the van, and if needed, another spare in the site office. But I wanted to check on our hidden key since it had been outside all winter and put a bit of oil on it. It was in a small box with a magnet attached to the bottom of the van, and I always placed it in the exact same spot. In the early days, returning from the pub, I had to crawl under the van. It was dark, dirty, smelly, and we were never sober. There was a lot of giggling. So I always put it in its little box in the exact same place so I could just reach under the van and pull it out. In fact, we haven't needed to use it since that one time. That was when things started to get a bit strange. I reached under the van, but it wasn't there. Not wanting to get dirty or smelly and being sober, I used my phone's light to see where it was. Everything was wrong. The location, the orientation. It was about a foot away from where it should have been and was at a strange angle. I always placed it fore and aft along the van so it would be easier to find. That was the plan. Things got stranger when I went into the van and saw the fridge was closed. It's always left open to prevent it from getting smelly. I opened the fridge, expecting to find mold and a bad smell, but there was nothing. This made me realize the van didn't smell as musty as in previous years. 
I wondered if someone had been using it. My first thought was Jason, but he would have told us. And his university is far away. He could have found a closer place for a holiday. I became more cautious and turned on the taps. There was a small spurt of water, which was strange because after I turned off the water supply in the autumn, I had drained the taps and left them open to prevent freezing and bursting the pipes. These had been shut. Jason would know to leave them open. Now I was concerned. Next, I checked the electricity meter. I know how much electricity it usually uses over the winter, and it's not much. A quick check showed it had used a massive amount compared to previous years. I didn't have the exact numbers with me, so I'd need to double check when I got home. I took a picture of the meter with my phone and sent Jason a text asking if he'd used the van over the winter. I meticulously inspected the van, but everything seemed in order. Still, I was cautious. I started taking things out, airing the bedding that had been stored in sealed bags and washed beforehand. Once that was done, I decided to make some coffee. It would have to be black since I hadn't brought any milk, but that wasn't a big deal. I prefer my tea and coffee with milk, but I can manage without it. I put the kettle on and noticed there was a bit of water left in it. I would have expected it to evaporate over the winter, even with the lid on. Just another thing to note. While waiting for the kettle to boil, I began wiping and dusting everything. When I checked the coffee jar, I was surprised to find it nearly full. I remembered it being almost empty when we left. I checked the expiry date, and it was still good for another six months. We usually don't leave much in the van over the winter. That Christmas trip was inconvenient because we had to bring almost everything with us. Practically the kitchen sink. Another thing to add to my list. I considered calling Caroline but decided against it. If someone else had been in the van, she might feel it was contaminated and wouldn't want to return. I needed to figure it out on my own and possibly keep it to myself. Hopefully, it was just Jason. Besides, she was likely busy, and I didn't want to ruin my surprise. I had sorted out the van and headed home, taking the roses with me since there was no point in leaving them there. I thought I could surprise Caroline with them. On my way out, I stopped by the site office and casually asked if anyone had seen anyone around our van recently. The staff said they hadn't noticed anyone, but they did mention seeing a fairly new red Mercedes estate a few vans down from ours every couple of weeks. It was parked next to an empty van, which seemed odd because people who drive that kind of car usually don't frequent holiday caravan parks, and the car was red. The staff figured it must have been okay since the gate required swipe access in the winter, meaning they must have had a pass. The office staff didn't have much to do during the winter. As I drove home, stuck in traffic, my mind started to wander. Who could be using the van? And who would know where the key was? Only three of us had access. While I was in the traffic jam, Jason called. It wasn't him. I told him I thought someone had been using the van but to keep it to himself. I didn't want to worry his mother who was already dealing with the Ofsted issue. I did mention that I planned to visit the van this weekend to surprise her. So if it wasn't Jason, then who was it? Being stuck in a traffic jam just outside Salisbury gives your mind plenty of time to wander. And that's not good. Maybe I've read too many stories online. I started piecing things together, but unfortunately my conclusions were either way off. It wasn't me, it wasn't Jason, so it could only have been Caroline, but why? I began reviewing the classic signs of someone having an affair. She didn't dress differently. She didn't rush to the shower as soon as she got home. She did work late, but I was always aware of it. And I tracked her phone. She was always where she was supposed to be. Although her phone wasn't always on, and there are places in the college where you can't get a signal. Our bed life remained the same. Perhaps it decreased a little because we both worked hard. Then a plan formed in my head. As I sat by the castle in yet another traffic jam, a piece of advice I'd heard before came to mind. Trust, but verify. Sitting there, I devised a plan. In fact, I came up with several plans to do just that. I continued waiting and contemplating. Had I spent too much time online? Was she having an affair? Why would she drive all the way down there when there were plenty of hotels they could stay at? But someone was using it. 
It's awful having so much time to think. Your mind wanders into dark places. But again, I didn't think she was. I hadn't seen any signs. Or was she just good at hiding them? Was I too trusting or too naive to notice or maybe a bit of both? All right, the first thing I needed to do was protect myself. According to the law, if you separate for any reason, everything is split 50-50. I loved that house we'd been living in for the past 15 years and we had made it our own. I had put in a lot of hard work on some of the renovations. I worked long hours to afford things I couldn't do myself. And then there was my pride and joy, a maroon MGB GT V8, almost fully restored. The savings account was in good shape, mostly from the overtime I earned because machines kept breaking down at work. If it turned out I was wrong, no harm done. That was important. My next plan was to set up some cameras in the van. I would visit the van later in the week, detour to the spy shop in Southampton, and pick up some Wi-Fi cameras and possibly a tracking device that I could attach to her car or drop in her handbag. The plans were all coming together in my head. First test. I had warned her that I might be home late, so I called her on the home landline. She answered right away, so at least I knew she was home. She said she hadn't prepared anything for dinner since she didn't know what time I'd be back. I told her I was just 10 minutes away. She suggested I pick up something to eat, like fish and chips, a pizza, or even Chinese food. She also asked how the meeting went. I said it was okay, but something had come up and I'd explain later. I asked her how her day was. She said it was hectic, but if they gave it their all, they could have a plan in a couple of weeks, although it might mean more late nights. I told her I was fine with that as long as we had the weekends together. Then she giggled and said she was looking forward to the weekends and had something planned for this weekend. It was hard for me to believe that the love of my life on the other end of the phone could be having an affair. I started feeling ashamed of my suspicions, but I needed to find out who was in the van so the plan could proceed in full. All right then. For the second test, I picked up a meat feast pizza, my favorite, but not hers. When I got home, everything was set up, even a bottle of wine. A bit unusual for a Tuesday, but I didn't think much of it. I opened the box and she noticed it was a meat feast. I placed a couple of slices on her plate. Sweetheart, you know I don't like the meatballs on this. The lightheartedness from when I first walked in had turned into a tone of grumpiness. Just put them over here and I'll swap my pepperoni for them. That's what we had done before. But she had never been grumpy about it. Was I imagining it? Or was I looking for issues that weren't there? Next test. She was carefully transferring a meatball from her pizza to mine halfway across the table when I started my story. I heard a rumor that someone at your workplace is having an affair. She dropped the meatball on the table. I picked it up and ate it anyway. I like meatballs. Where did you hear that? At the meeting I attended, someone mentioned your college and that someone named Julian was having an affair with a colleague and got caught. There's nobody at our place named Julian. They must have been mistaken. However, when she accidentally dropped the meatball, it sparked a nagging suspicion in my mind. Did she possess certain knowledge? Perhaps someone with a name like Julian was involved? It added another item to my growing list of concerns. But this incident marked just the beginning of a series of remarks that guided the conversation where I intended it to go. I inquired, is there some kind of moral clause in your contract? You shouldn't be associating with married individuals, especially around young and impressionable people. It sets a poor standard. Well, I believe there is, but I'll need to double check. Why the sudden interest? She responded. It's the chaos it all caused, the shattered lives, with no one left financially stable. Everything had to be divided equally, but there wasn't much to go around. Both ended up in less than desirable living situations. Two marriages were destroyed and four lives impacted. One even lost their job. It could have been both. If there's no Julian, perhaps he confused colleges. Still, it's troubling, isn't it? 
The person who breaks their marriage vows ends up with half of everything. Though in their case, it seems there wasn't much to claim. I sensed a slight paling of her face and her silence thereafter. Except for eating her pizza with extra pepperoni. No meatballs. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I grew uneasy. We decided to watch something uninteresting on TV as usual, intending to discuss it afterward. However, tonight, there was an unusual lack of conversation. I wondered if I was overanalyzing small occurrences. Unsure, I resolved to proceed cautiously, avoiding delving too deeply into investigation. The next step would be risky, but necessary for my peace of mind. I couldn't help but notice her frequent glances at her phone, suggesting a desire to use it. Just past nine, her phone rang, startling her. Glancing at the screen, she informed me, It's my sister. I have to take this. Naturally, she didn't need an excuse. With that, she left for the kitchen with her phone. This departure from our usual routine struck me. I typically enjoyed her family's company, though her parents were a bit odd. Normally, she'd answer calls in my presence, sometimes even involving me in the conversation. Now I was attuned to the slightest deviations from the norm. Quietly increasing the TV volume, I stealthily made my way toward the kitchen, intending to eavesdrop, a skill I prided myself on. However, I reminded myself to trust but verify as I listened in. I struggled to hear clearly over the blaring television, but it seemed like, Sorry, darling, we're occupied at the moment. I'll ring you tomorrow. Goodbye. It felt rushed. I waited. Then came the words I feared. I think he's figured it out. Stay away from me tomorrow. There was a pause. He's behaving strangely. I can't risk losing him. Another pause. No promotion is worth my marriage. That was all I needed to hear. I returned to the couch and mindlessly watched TV. I couldn't care less about what was on. She came back. I casually inquired about her sister. She assured me they were all fine. Young Emily had hurt her knee. Typical for her being a bit of a tomboy. Then she snuggled up to me, whispering, I think it's bedtime if you catch my drift. Oh, damn. I tried my best, but it's hard to focus when you suspect someone else might have shared this intimacy. Nevertheless, I soldiered through. Afterward, with her in my arms, I remarked, That was unusual for a weekday. What's gotten into you? I just adore my man, and we haven't been as intimate during the week lately. I prodded a bit. So it's not guilt, then? I expected a comeback, but there was none. In the morning, I followed my usual routine for work, but I called my boss to inform him that I was taking another day off, yet would remain reachable in case of any urgent matters. Doubts had begun to plague my mind. I visited a local thrift store and purchased a second-hand smartphone. Then I made a brief stop at the library to create Gmail and Hotmail email accounts using their computer. Afterward, I went to the nearby supermarket to acquire a SIM-only mobile phone plan, all under my new email addresses. It wasn't a significant expense, and if she proved innocent, I could easily discard them. However, if she was guilty, it would be money well spent. On my way to the van, I made a detour to a spy shop in Southampton, where I obtained two Wi-Fi cameras and a tracker, suitable for placement in her car or handbag. Back in the van, I installed the two cameras, connecting them to Wi-Fi. One was positioned to monitor the bedroom, while the other covered the lounge and kitchen area. Luckily, I had access to mains power, so there was no need for batteries. These cameras were motion-activated and would transmit video directly to my new phone upon activation. As an additional measure, I concocted a mixture using a jar of old coffee, discarding most of it and adding crushed sleeping tablets left over from Caroline's mother's visit. I couldn't be certain of the dosage, so I kept adding until the coffee took on a slightly lighter hue. I made a mental note to bring another jar next time I visited. Deep down, I hoped my suspicions were unfounded. As I headed home, I drove past her college and noticed a recently registered red Mercedes estate in the parking lot. Upon returning, I devoted some time to organizing paperwork. I had a strong suspicion by now that she was having an affair. 
However, I wanted to keep an open mind in case I was mistaken. If I was wrong, it would be something I'd have to accept. Later, as we went to bed, she became affectionate again, which struck me as odd. I looked at her and remarked, We haven't been intimate during the week for months, and now you're interested two nights in a row. Is everything okay? Perhaps your boyfriend isn't meeting your needs during the week. Her expression of shock was priceless. Are you accusing me of having an affair? She retorted. I was just curious about the sudden change in behavior. We've been reserved to weekends for months, and now it's twice in two nights. It's quite a shift, I replied. She repeated herself, asking, Are you suggesting I'm having an affair? To that, I replied, If the shoe fits. That silenced her. It was nonsense, of course, but it had the desired effect. Things grew tense after that, and we didn't even engage in simple gestures of affection. It was only going to get more difficult for her. Despite this, I cared for her deeply, and I was devising an exit plan for her, if she'd accept it. Yet I was also preparing to safeguard myself if she didn't. On Thursday evening, I arrived home with everything ready. Caroline looked beautiful as I entered, seemingly torn between reconciliation and not appearing too desperate. It wasn't my favorite meal, but it was close. We had a bottle of wine and the dinner was pleasant. We talked about mundane topics, my projects, her college, their plans to navigate through their troubles, and how things were progressing. To disrupt the routine, I did something unusual. Normally, Caroline would clear the plates and load the dishwasher, but this time I took care of it, hastily placing everything in the wrong spots. But I didn't mind. She seemed surprised by my actions. As I sat back down at the table, I reached across and asked her to give me both of her hands, which she did. Sweetheart, we need to talk, I said, and her expression dropped. I stared directly into her eyes and confessed, My love for you knows no bounds. I can't imagine life without you. After a momentary pause, I continued. But this whole Julian situation has me concerned. We've put so much effort into creating a wonderful home, where we've raised our son, a place we both cherish. Yet, if one of us messes up, we both suffer the consequences. So I've devised a plan. It's not something either of us will like, but it's the best solution I could come up with. She appeared thoroughly bewildered. That was precisely what I wanted. Taking a sheet of paper and a pen from my pocket, I turned it towards her. The header read, Post-Nuptial Agreement. I could sense her frustration building. Why? She demanded. Listen. In this country, even if one of us were to stray, we'd still end up splitting everything down the middle. So if I were to cheat, I'd still walk away with half and vice versa. But neither of us has strayed, so why the issue? She pondered for a while before replying, I don't want to. Why not? It just doesn't seem right. Why? What are you hiding? I've got nothing to hide. I love you and would never betray you. I've got no reason to take a risk. And if you're not hiding anything, then what's the harm? I just don't want to, she paused. And it feels like you don't trust me. I pretended to ponder her question, though I had anticipated it and knew she would ask. She was right. I had a response prepared. It was nonsense, but I had one. But signing it indicates trust in our marriage, she insisted. As I suspected, it was nonsense. Nevertheless, I continued. What are you hiding? What have you done? If you're innocent and have nothing to hide, then why hesitate? I have no intention of cheating, nor have I cheated. I'll sign. With that, I picked up the pen and signed the document. The only reason I can think of for not signing is if you've cheated on me or planned to. I would never betray you like that, she protested, tears streaming down her face, guilt evident in her expression. I was fairly certain I was right. I just needed confirmation. Then why refuse to sign, I inquired. This is a major decision that requires careful consideration. We're talking about our future. Forever. What if things don't work out? 
Her point was valid, as I had already acknowledged. I rose from my seat. Take your time to think it over, and I'll consider what to do if we encounter difficulties. But I'm heading to the club for a beer while I ponder. I had already decided to visit the rugby club. Thursdays were always bustling there. British rugby clubs are often populated by educated individuals such as doctors, solicitors, lawyers, and psychiatrists. Among them, I sought out a solicitor friend with whom I used to play rugby. As we both aged and slowed down, the physical toll became more apparent, prompting us to switch to playing cricket together. Over a beer, I approached him for a favor, showing him my post-nuptial agreement. Without glancing up, he questioned, Do you suspect Caroline of infidelity? I grinned as he finally met my gaze. I'll need to consult my colleagues, he remarked before departing. Within our rugby club, certain areas serve as discussion hubs, like the doctor's corner where medical matters are debated. Similarly, solicitors, psychiatrists, and lawyers have their own zones for consultations. Meanwhile, the rest of us occupy the remainder of the bar. It may seem stratified, but it functions effectively. My friend came back to me, and his first words took me by surprise. You should treat that group over there to a couple of beers, he said. So, they gave you advice and you rewarded them by making you their client. And if your marriage falls apart, he paused, showing unusual frankness with a friend. I'm sorry, buddy, but if everything goes wrong, she'll poach all the best lawyers in town. Those who remain don't know anything about rugby or cricket. He smiled at me, and I went on and bought a few beers. We found a quiet place at a table and he started talking. If everyone had drawn up contracts like this, we would all be out of business. I raised an eyebrow. He explained, Everything is simple for you. No vague terms such as reasonable or considering. You declare that if one of the two specified partners enters into a relationship with someone not mentioned in this agreement, this will be fulfilled. An extramarital affair is defined as any bed contact not named in this agreement. Any intimacy can beat it, from kissing to intimacy. Will that stand up in court? I inquired. Our in-house divorce attorney snapped a photo of it as an example, so I believe it will. There may be some adjustments you could make, but it's fairly solid as it is, he replied. He mentioned that the financial terms were quite generous. The cheating partner would receive one-third of all savings and their car, while the aggrieved party would retain the house, two-thirds of the savings, and their car. We have around $160,000 in savings, so the cheating partner wouldn't be left destitute. That's when he hit me with the bad news. This can't apply retroactively. It can only apply to the future. Otherwise, it could be seen as entrapment if she is currently having or has had an affair. Why is that? If she is currently having an affair, and you know or suspect it, it might seem like you're exploiting the situation to gain an advantage over her, such as obtaining the house and most of the savings in this case. That would be viewed as entrapment. However, if she is having an affair and stops upon receiving this paperwork, then you'll need to find another reason to divorce her and retain the house. That wasn't my intention. Bugger. But even if she was having an affair, it would cease and we could return to normal. I'd deal with whoever he was later. Well, that settled it. I expressed gratitude to him and agreed to meet again sometime next week. After settling my obligations, I headed home, reflecting on my deep affection for the woman I've shared my life with for over two decades. Despite the inevitable changes, from Jason's arrival to his departure as he grew up, we've maintained a strong bond. I was willing to give her another chance, perhaps foolishly or timidly, but my love for her endured, spanning over twenty years. However, if she declined, consequences would follow. Maybe I'd unleash the neighbor's noisy Jack Russell Terrier on her. Upon arriving home, I found her sitting in front of the television, tears evident on her face. Though she appeared less radiant than usual, my love for her remained steadfast. Taking a seat beside her, I gently turned her to face me. I could sense her inner turmoil, yet words eluded her. So, I began. 
Darling, Julian's involvement has troubled me deeply and I must address it. I've consulted my friends at the club about our post-nuptial agreement and they've advised against backdating it. If either of us has been unfaithful in the past, it's behind us. Her initial reaction was one of anger which I chose to disregard as I continued, I'm certain I've been faithful, and though I trust you have been too, I can't prove it. Regardless, signing this agreement means moving forward together, leaving the past behind us. I was completely stunned by the overwhelming display of relief, love, and tears from the woman in front of me. It was incredibly excessive. She was clearly distraught, further convincing me of her infidelity. Damn. What should I do now? I lay awake all night, now certain of her betrayal but lacking any evidence. What the hell should I do next? The woman I adore, the mother of my child whom I cherish. Sleep eluded me. While I was previously willing to forgive in the cold darkness of the night, my certainty wavered. I woke from my restless sleep, feeling far from refreshed. The smell of toast and coffee greeted me. Managing to make it downstairs, I found Caroline bustling about, unusually cheerful. There in front of my chair sat a pot of tea adorned with a charming tea cozy to keep it warm. Caroline poured herself some coffee and sat across from me, taking my hands in hers. Darling, I apologize for not understanding your perspective earlier. I thought it over last night, and you're right. What Julian did, and whoever he was with, was unforgivable. With that, she produced our postnuptial agreement and an ink pen, not the cheap biro I had used, and signed it, crucially dating it as well. At that moment, I made the decision to leave the past behind. I resolved to overcome any lingering worries and doubts. Though I acknowledged that there would still be some nagging uncertainties, I vowed to monitor them, as well as keep an eye on her. I had somewhat forgotten about our planned weekend getaway in the van, thinking there would always be another weekend. However, my concerns resurfaced when Caroline mentioned she needed to travel to Bristol for a Monday meeting due to a colleague dropping out. Despite wanting to trust her, a small part of me remained skeptical. I pushed aside these doubts for the weekend but made mental preparations. Caroline seemed cheerful throughout the weekend. On Saturday, I casually mentioned heading to the football club for a drink, and she didn't react. Even though it was unusual for me as I'm not a football fan, I could have easily walked since it's just a short distance away, but I took the car. Her happiness must have clouded her judgment to the obvious signs. I stopped by a friend's place to borrow his car for Monday, and everything was arranged. We discussed her weekend getaway. She's catching the train to Bristol early Monday morning and returning Tuesday evening. A hotel was arranged and she'd inform me of its location, along with providing her mobile number for contact. Although I offered to drop her at the station on my way to work, she declined, opting to gather with others at the college for a group minibus ride. While the plan seemed illogical since the college was en route to the station, I didn't press it. The weekend was amazing. She nearly exhausted me with intimacy, and despite my efforts, she had difficulty walking on Sunday. However, guilt lingered in my mind. If my wife boards the train to Bristol, I'll be content. Upon learning her hotel, she might receive a surprise visit from her adoring man that evening. But if not, the neighbor's yappy dog might find itself unleashed. On Monday, I was determined to confirm my suspicions, which persisted in my mind. I couldn't shake them off. I successfully placed the tracker in her handbag. It was spacious enough to conceal numerous trackers. As long as the tracker and her mobile phone remained together and headed west, I would feel satisfied mostly. I needed to overcome my guilt for doubting her, though I was confident I could manage it. Adding to my suspicions, I noticed a small carton of milk in the fridge alongside the nearly full two-liter one. When I inquired, Carolyn explained she had been asked to bring some. Why would anyone bring milk to a hotel? Now I was certain something fishy was going on. With the help of a sharp knife and a syringe, I replaced about a third of the milk with vodka. 
Since she wouldn't need to drive anywhere, there was no risk to her license or the possibility of getting into an accident while intoxicated. My boss was a little upset when I took another day off. I sat with my phone and tracked both her phone and the tracker. They both reached her workplace, then her phone went offline, but the tracker remained active and started moving south toward the coast, not west toward Bristol. With this information I sprung into action. I called my friend and arranged to pick up his car, intending to leave mine at home along with my phone. I didn't want my car to be spotted anywhere but here. If anyone checked my phone, it would show it was at our house. I set up my computer and another device I had rigged over the keyboard to simulate activity, ensuring it stayed logged onto the internet while someone was using it. I checked the surveillance cameras in the van. They were operational but showed no movement. I called the college to inquire about the hotel my wife was supposed to be staying at, only to learn she had taken a day off. That was my cue to call the neighbors and see if the Jack Russell was available for tomorrow night. It was time to take action. As I left the house, I grabbed a tube of super glue and some gloves from the garage. I jumped into my friend's car and drove past the college, checking to see if there was a red Mercedes station wagon nearby. Did that mean there was still hope? The next stop was a local adult store where I bought some toys. As I was leaving, something else caught my attention and I paid in cash so as not to leave paper trails. When I got to Holiday Park, I decided not to go inside but to park my friend's car on the next street and walk. Of course, there was a red Mercedes estate, although it wasn't parked next to our van. Notifications were buzzing on my phone during the trip and considering that I had set up alerts only for surveillance cameras, I had a pretty good idea what they were about. After connecting to Wi-Fi, my worst suspicions were confirmed when I watched what was happening in the van. They were inside with him, among a pile of clothes, and apparently had just finished a date. I heard her making coffee, complaining about the situation, and he advised her to add more milk to hide the taste. They then returned to bed, where she expressed her regrets, citing the risk to what they had built together and her growing anxiety. He reassured her with dismissive confidence, citing legal advice and their mutual enjoyment of the affair. Despite the excitement, she confirmed her love for her partner and the need to end it, acknowledging the looming threat of a prenuptial agreement after the wedding. However, he remained convinced of their ability to remain unnoticed and appealed to her desire to continue the affair. That's interesting, said one of my friends from the rugby club, who happened to be a divorce lawyer. He mentioned that it would be unfortunate for me to find out. I will miss this, though, he remarked. Using the van was a good idea. I might need to convince my wife to get one, a fancy one, though. She's quite strict with my finances. But you have that fancy Mercedes. That's her money. You don't think a college deputy principal could afford one, do you? But I do better than your mechanic friend. Don't criticize him. I just told you that I love him. He's a good man, and you're trying to belittle him. And as for intimacy, you're fine. He's actually better. I never comment on your wife or your fascination with younger women. He waved away her remarks and continued, Maybe we can resume this when he's less suspicious. When I become director, I will need a new secretary, and you know what that means. I noticed that she was smiling at him. Yes, I do. You'll want more from me. I'll think about it. She paused. No, this is the last time. I love him, and I can't risk losing him. You've been entertaining me. She yawned, and he followed suit. Do you know if I'm really tired? We have time to have another drink and then take a nap before dinner. I need to be ready for this phone call around 7 o'clock. I didn't look at them. It was too painful. Nevertheless, I continued to record. It was also possible to capture intimacy. It didn't seem to last long and I didn't hear any sounds indicating that she liked it. Maybe I was above it, or maybe they were just tired. They fell asleep quickly. I knocked on the side of the van while I was watching the video, but no one moved. Inside, I found his pants, 
car keys, this phone, her phone, and her purse. I took out the carrier bag I had brought from the adult store along with the trash liner. I put on the gloves I had brought with me so as not to leave fingerprints, especially on him. I hesitated whether to put on a cock cage or handcuffs first. I chose the rooster cage and locked it with a small brass lock. I enjoyed every click of the ratchet as I tightened the handcuffs. Then I carefully applied super glue to the brass lock on the cage and to the keyhole of the handcuffs. Afterward, I secured Caroline's left wrist with the handcuffs and proceeded to strip the van of any fabric I could find. Towels, curtains, even the rug from in front of the fake fireplace. I wanted to ensure they had nothing to cover themselves with. Their clothing had been neatly arranged near the front door. I removed all the sharp knives from the drawer to prevent any damage to the furniture. Using their phones, I took photographs of them. Initially, I intended to use only hers, but I managed to unlock his phone using his thumbprint and remove the passcode. The most challenging part was removing the sheet they were lying on. I had to cut it up. Additionally, I took the pillows, toilet paper, coffee jar, and cups they had used, leaving behind the milk. Moving on to the next step of my plan, I took his car and parked it next to mine, transferring the folding bicycle I had into it. All their clothing was packed in a plastic bag in the back of his car. I had spent considerable time considering what to do with his car. There were no nearby gravel pits to dispose of it, and I didn't want to drive it into a river or the sea. Setting it on fire in the woods would still attract attention. I wanted it to vanish completely. Then I recalled something I had read online. I drove the car to the rough part of town where dubious characters loitered. I left it there with the doors unlocked and the keys on the dashboard. If those individuals were sensible, they would remove it from the street, change its number plates, or dismantle it for spare parts promptly. However, it's more likely that it will be joy-ridden and destroyed but that's of no concern to me. I still had their cell phones, her purse, and his wallet in my possession. I emptied out the cash from his wallet and her purse and transferred it into mine. It wasn't much, but it will cover some of the cost of the toys I bought. I left his credit cards on the car seat, just in case someone unscrupulous decided to use them. I took her credit cards, snapped them in half, and discarded them into a nearby drain. His wallet and her purse went into a garbage bin. I unfolded the bike and made my way toward the holiday park. Once I was in a safer area, I retrieved the slip of paper I had brought from home and dialed the number saved on his phone. It dawned on me that I didn't even know his name. To us, he was just the deputy principal. I could have checked his credit cards for it. Hello? Is this the South Coast Gazette? Yes, who am I speaking with? An anonymous tipster. We don't accept anonymous tips over the phone without verification. I'm sorry I can't provide that. I work for our local MP and I'm concerned he's involved in something inappropriate. These Greens always act so morally superior, but they're not immune to scandal. Right now he's in a caravan with another man's wife. Seems like there's some unconventional activity going on. MPs having affairs isn't groundbreaking news, but the unconventional aspect adds some spice especially since he's the local Green MP. I sensed they were interested because they inquired about the location, and I obliged. I continued back to the Holiday Park and found a serene corner where I could observe the van and monitor the activity inside, which was minimal. Soon after, I noticed a car parking nearby, an odd choice of location. To occupy myself, I began sending short video clips from my phone to theirs, followed by images and videos to everyone in their contacts list, including the South Coast Gazette. This occupied me for about 20 minutes until the constant ringing and text notifications from their phones became overwhelming, prompting me to switch them off. Then I noticed a slight movement on the camera. They were waking up. Silently, I positioned myself beside the van and knocked vigorously. The shock on their faces upon awakening was remarkable. There was frantic screaming especially from him, perhaps due to pain as she recoiled with a wince, clutching her wrist. I could elaborate on their panicked movements around the van, but there was no real escape. After composing themselves, they realized their clothes were missing. 
he yelled while she sobbed uncontrollably. The commotion caught the attention of the man in the car, prompting him to exit and approach the caravan, where it seemed they were aware of his arrival. Leaning out of his window, he inquired if he could assist by contacting the police, sensing there was a problem. It was then that he noticed the camera in the man's car and presumed him to be a journalist. Ah, a journalist, he thought to himself. The journalist inquired about the issue, only to be informed vaguely that there had been an incident requiring police assistance. The journalist proved helpful, snapping a few photos before dialing the police in the tranquil coastal town, where little occurred in early spring. The police arrived promptly, and the images captured inside shed light on the situation. Paramedics were summoned by the police, and amidst the activity, it became apparent that the policeman's keys were ineffective due to superglue, adding an unexpected twist. A policeman came in with wire cutters and separated the lovers. They tried to open the lock on the rooster cage with wire cutters, but found that it was also taped. Apparently, superglue accidentally spilled on his instrument as well. Despite the best efforts of the paramedics, they were unable to remove everything that I had glued to them. Maybe they needed a superglue solvent, although I wasn't sure if there was one. Then both people were taken to the hospital, where I assumed there would be a lot of work, which prompted me to go home. I have one more task left before I leave. I packed my toolbox and took the batteries out of their phones. Tempted to throw them away, I decided they might come in handy later. When I got home in the dark, I immediately tried to call my wife from my personal phone, which had been lying at home next to my computer all day. Oddly enough, it went straight to voicemail. At least I managed to register an outgoing call. After removing the device from my computer, I deleted several pages with incomprehensible characters and started filling out several online forms. I printed them out, signed one, and put it in an envelope. Around 8.30, there was a knock on the front door. A young policeman stood there, asking for my confirmation of identity. After I confirmed, he inquired about the whereabouts of my wife. I informed him she was staying at a hotel in Bristol and that I had attempted to reach her by phone without success. Displaying a photo on his phone, he asked, Is this your wife? I acknowledged the resemblance but remarked that she appeared disheveled. To my surprise, he informed me she was not in Bristol, but was at Christchurch Police Station, possibly associated with the caravan we owned there. Perplexed, I mentioned she was supposed to be in Bristol for a meeting. The officer suggested I inquire directly with her and asked if I could retrieve her. Questioning how she got there and why she couldn't return independently, I received no answers, only the suggestion to ask her directly. He also questioned my whereabouts throughout the day, to which I explained I had been at home, working online. After jotting down my explanation, he accepted it. Though I worried about potential scrutiny regarding my friend's car, I held on to the belief of innocence until proven guilty. Despite potential investigation, I assumed they were preoccupied with other matters. Driving to the Christchurch police station, I announced my intention to collect my wife upon arrival. The officer inquired if I had any clothes for her, as she was currently only wrapped in one of those metallic foil sheets and a blanket. I informed them I did not. It seemed the urgency of her needing clothes had been overlooked. Maybe the young officer who visited my house hadn't mentioned it. Or if he had, perhaps I didn't catch it. I reiterated that I didn't have any clothes. It must have slipped my mind in the rush to get here. Regardless, I asked about her clothes, but received the familiar response. You'll have to ask her, sir. They went to fetch her, and she appeared disheveled with smeared makeup and unkempt hair, looking dreadful. As she approached, she instinctively reached out until she realized she was naked under the sheet. I gestured for her to stop when she came within reach, then handed her the envelope. I believe she understood its contents. She collapsed on the floor in tears. I assisted her to her feet and guided her to the car, with one of the officers helping with doors. The kind officer aided me in getting her into the car. I informed him we were going to seat her in the back. 
While we were placing her in the car, I noticed a woman across the parking lot whom I thought I recognized, using a handbag to strike a man on the head. He was draped in a silver blanket. The policeman assisting me quickly left and rushed over to intervene, pulling her away. I drove towards home with her crying the entire two-hour journey, but I wasn't heading to our usual house. My relationship with her parents wasn't the best. We simply tolerated each other. They're deeply religious, whereas I am not, though I believe in the principles of the Ten Commandments, the Magna Carta, and Sikh beliefs in equality for all, striving to avoid the mistakes of the past as advocated by Cicero. These, I think, form a solid foundation for moral standards. Though I must confess I haven't always adhered to them, especially in my youth and particularly in the past week or so. I wasn't certain how her parents would react to me showing up with her in such a state, especially after all the pictures and videos I had sent them and others. When the car finally came to a stop, I circled around and opened the door. Extending my hand, I assisted her in stepping out, only for her to realize we were at her parents' house, not ours. She appeared horrified, tears streaming down her face. She gazed at me and pleaded, Please, take me home. No, I replied. Please, why? She implored. I offered you a choice, I reminded her. What choice? She questioned amid tears. To betray or not to betray? You chose betrayal. I suspected you were having an affair but lacked proof. I gave you an opportunity. If it was in the past, we could have moved forward, grown old together. Yet you chose to continue betraying. As we pulled up, her mother emerged and immediately slapped her daughter. Then she turned to me and asked, Is there any hope? None. I replied. Caroline glanced at me, pleading, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Please take me home. I met her gaze and uttered with a heavy heart, I presented you with a choice, which you disregarded. Her father joined us, guiding her towards the house. I then turned around and walked back around the car. Her mother followed me, asking once more if there was any possibility. I took out my phone and and showed her the clip where he had asked to start over after my initial suspicion had subsided, and she had responded, Yes, I do. You'll want more of me. I'll think about it. But I stopped the clip before she said, No. After that, I got into the car and drove away. The post-nuptial agreement held up. She sought counsel from a reputable divorce attorney, coincidentally one from my rugby club, for guidance. He merely provided advice, pointing out that she had willingly violated the post-nup and therefore had no legal ground to stand on. She didn't attempt to challenge it. I ended up with the house, a little over $100,000, and my MG. As anticipated, they both lost their jobs. They didn't require a morality clause. Their actions spoke for themselves. They were dismissed for bringing the college into disrepute. I believe the military employs a similar concept. He went through a divorce and it seems she took him for everything he had. There were rumors about a prenuptial agreement given her substantial wealth at the time of their marriage. He would likely never work in academia again and I suspect the same fate awaited her. I gifted Caroline the caravan. Personally, I wouldn't want to set foot in it again. I heard through Jason who only occasionally communicates with her that she found some minor employment down there. I did encounter her at Jason's wedding, and she looked worse for wear. I was single at the time, and didn't bring a date. She approached me and pleaded, I'm truly sorry, can we try again? I offered you a choice, and you chose to betray me. With that, I turned and walked away.